Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at Guiding Star with Ksenia. And we are having our Sunday coffee sessions today. I hope you've all got your coffee. Ksenia, do you have your coffee? <laughs> I do. I'm totally ready. Yeah. Yes, wonderful. So um, I can't wait to introduce you to the wonderful woman um, that we've got lined up for this interview today. I'm conducting these Sunday coffee sessions as um, interviews with inspiring healers and an inspiring astrologers who are actually joining me at Guiding Star with Ksenia to offer their services to help people, especially through this year, 2020. But since I went through my own dark night of the soul a number of years ago now, I've always had a dream to share wellness practices with other people as a source of healing. And so this has led me on my journey to find practitioners that are stellar, <laughs> uh, who are top notch, um, who are in their field. And so astrology can, is something that can provide answers and remedies. Astrology can provide wisdom and prepare us for what might be unfolding in the world as well. And we can get insights into our past through astrology too. But tarot is actually a beautiful complement to astrology as a source of guidance from spirit for us. And, you know, we really need guidance and support, especially now in 2020. So I want to introduce you to Ksenia. I'll just give you a bit of background how Ksenia and I met. Um, Ksenia quite obviously has the same name as me. <laughs> and um, she came to me for a reading Oh, it must be a couple of months ago now. And of course, we were very intrigued, or well, I was very intrigued by her sharing my name. I've never actually met anyone who shares my name before. My name is the anglicized spelling of Ksenia, which um, you might be able to share a bit more information about this in a second yourself, Ksenia, uh, of a um, what I had been led to believe was a former Yugoslavian um, sort of name. My mother had taught um, Yugoslavian immigrants back in the 70s uh, here in Australia, and that's where she got my name from. But I have a very um, sort of Irish, Welsh, Scottish, English background, <laughs> um, but my name is from that part of the world. So needless to say, Ksenia and I had a lot to chat about when we first met when she came for a reading. And it transpired that, you know, I, I just felt like I'd found the most jewel of a person. I was fascinated oh. by her. I oh, know, true. I was really fascinated by your Russian background. I was just captivated by the fact you have a PhD in medieval Irish literature and your love for Celtic mythologies. Oh my God, I was just so excited by all that. And soon our talks led to Ksenia doing a tarot card reading for me. And let me just tell you guys, I was so blown away. It was amazing. Her reading was so compassionate, so wise, so full of knowledge. It was, it's truly um, intuitively done. And she really picked up on the energies that were unfolding in my life at that time when she did the reading. Plus, one thing I love, Ksenia, with the reading that you did was that you drew in the, your knowledge of mythology, your knowledge of, um, you know, the, the ancient, well, in this case, Celtic uh, systems, and you use those in your interpretations of the cards and their stories and their messages, the messages behind the cards. It was utterly incredible. It absolutely blew me away. So look, without further ado, I don't want to ramble, ramble, ramble here. We're all dying to meet you, Ksenia. Um, I'd like to welcome you here to the channel and thank you so much for joining us. Well, Ksenia, thank you for inviting me. What can I say? <laughs> it's totally an honor and it's been a privilege and it is a privilege to share my knowledge of tarot because I've been on this journey for about 15 years by now. It's like a part of my life. It's like my arm or leg by now. It's just like part of me. And if it can be of any service to others, it is my utmost pleasure, for sure. That's beautiful. And look, it, it just, it drips from you in the most beautiful way. I can see how you live and breathe it. It's so lovely. So, Ksenia, when I was growing up, I didn't know much about tarot. I didn't know much about astrology or any of those things, certainly in the environment I grew up in. It, it wasn't actually even encouraged. So, to be perfectly honest, I don't know a lot about tarot. I, I've never actually gone down that road. So, I'd love you to tell people like me and anyone else out there who's had a background similar to mine who doesn't know what tarot is, what it's actually all about. Close all right. Me. So I suppose everyone should know that tarot is a deck of cards <laughs> to begin yeah. with. We have 78 cards, so uh, 22 major arcana. Arcana means the mystery. And if, uh, 
56 minor arcana, which actually became the basis for our playing cards, yeah, with four suits, with the numbers, like two, three, four, and then with the court cards, which are page, queen, king, and aces, you know? Oh, so, so tarot came that's first. The best. Uh, I think so, yeah. I think so. Because Tarot came first as a card game. It appeared in, apparently, we don't really know where it came, where it's coming from, but apparently it originated in 16th century Renaissance Italy as a card game called Tarocchi. And uh, it used to be a card game. It was never used as a tool for divination up to 17th, 18th century. Then it became the tool for divination. And I think it also, there are kind of stages that first it was only minor arcana and then major arcana were kind of added. And they're so suggestive because there is the death arcana, there is like a fate, fortune arcana, and like, you know, star, silent, or oh, strength yeah. and I think it was yeah. suggestive in a way that we could use it in a very different way and I think that many tarot readers these days they actually absolutely disregard the fact that it used to be the game but I'm the opposite I'm clinging to this fact oh. because like you know as a historian I know that when you think of it game is a metaphor for life yes <laughs> there is like a brilliant like you know philosophical kind of research or a book like you know essay well not an essay because it's a whole volume by Dutch philosopher Jochen Herzinger and it's called Homo Ludens you know our species of human it's called Homo sapiens yes and Homo yes. Ludens is meaning a man playing a playing man and that's what he's suggesting that we are not the knowing man we're not Homo sapiens we're a playing Oh, we're playing creatures because he thinks that ritual and game it is what kind of gives a boost to our cultural development, to our spiritual development. That's what we need. Basically, we have this gene of necessity for game, for playfulness. And when we think of it... In yeah, my, when I in was... my background as a town planner, one of the, the, there was five top elements that allowed a town to thrive. And one of those elements was play. If a, if a town didn't celebrate, didn't play together, the, the small town was likely to sort of shrivel up and die and go away in um, sort of neoliberal culture. So it's the same for us humans. I love this. Sorry to interrupt. Keep going. No, we should keep it up as a dialogue because <laughs> I don't want to be like on the stage monologuing. <laughs> you know? uh, <laughs> Let's keep it playful. I, yeah. And then <laughs> when I started thinking of it, like drawing my knowledge of ancient cultures, you know, I started thinking because like in old Norse tradition, you know, the end of the world is Ragnarok, the death of gods. But then because like the history for ancient people is cyclical, so there is no such thing as death. It's all rebirth. Mm -hmm. So when the world is reborn, how it is shown is that on the sunlit plane, the gods, the resurrected gods are playing chess. They're playing like Tavli. It's some old Icelandic game, something like backgammon or chess. I don't know. We don't really know. But it is this recreation of worlds through game. And another example which came to my mind is that in the tomb of Egyptian Queen Nefertari, there is a fresco of her playing an ancient Egyptian game, Semet. It's also some sort of chess. If yes. you Google it, it's very famous. I suggest everyone after this lecture should go and Google it. When you Google Nefertari playing like, you know, Semet in her, in uh, or like Nefertari images from her tomb, you would see it straight away. So she's sitting and she's playing this, she's kind of moving figurines across the t table. And she has no opponent because it's, she's playing with her destiny. Yeah, she's playing with, with, with gods like, you know, who would bring her to the other world. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. I'm gonna Google that as soon as we finish chatting. I, I, I will send you the picture. Yeah, I will yeah. send you the picture after. And yeah, and like the recent example, you know, the Seven Seal movie on if Ingmar Bergman with this famous final scene when the knight is playing chess with death. And for me, this is all what Tara is about. It is like, it is still a game for me. And I think it's so important because I see so many people who are afraid of tarot. People mm -hmm. come up to me and lots of people are interested in it, but they're like, oh, I watched this program about tarot. It's 78 cards. You need to memorize each single meaning. Then there are scary cards, like all oh, the 10 of swords, which a pierced figure with swords. There's death, there's tower. Oh, and 
the tower card. I just know about the tower card. That, that, you know what? Everyone is afraid of the tower <laughs> card. Although I think it's such a good card, to be honest, because it's exactly the way how we in- interpret it. If we take it in a playful way, if we take it, because what what are those cards? What are those like tower, star? They're symbols. They are archetypes. Mm-hmm. And symbols they are universal. They have multiple meanings. We can all rely to symbols. Yeah. And uh, when we do a spread, it's basically what we are doing. We are doing a narrative. Yes. It's a tool for creating. We are doing, what, what is it called? Those kids' books with pictures, like comic books, right? Yes, yes. That's, that's what we end up with. We have this spread and it's like a story told through pictures. And we interpret them by interpreting the language of symbols, which, yeah. are, which is encoded in the cards. And, and that's so, what mythology was all along, wasn't it? That like even the planets and the mythology no, of the ancient yeah. Greeks and Romans were mytho- mythological representations of what the planets were up to and what they represented. I just, I love mythology. But and I there love is the such a universality in all this because it's all based on symbols and ancient myths are based on symbols. And that's why, for example, tarot was merged with astrology by the Golden Dawn you know there is this golden dawn society yeah mm-hmm. with the uh, elena blavatsky and stuff and the first most famous tarot deck is the raider wade tarot and raider mm-hmm. wade and wade they were members mm-hmm. of the golden dawn society and in this society actually the first time the idea that cards they represent astrological phenomenon as well for example the emperor is aries the high priestess is moon two of swords is moon in libra four of pentacles is sun in capricorn so each single card was assigned astrological meanings because they actually all speak the same language yes wow yeah and speaking of narratives you know what it's at some point when it all started the puzzle started kind of being put together in my head uh, a friend of mine gave me this book it's the book of Italo Calvino it's called the castle of cross and destinies oh. and Italo Calvino, he was a very famous Italian journalist and writer but what he did is that he retold the stories which we all know the mythological stories so Oedipus King Hamlet uh, what is it uh, Parsifal the quest for the holy grail through the tarot cards. So basically what he did, you see there are, he, the cards are printed here. Yes. And he's telling those myths step by step by cards. What? Because as, it's exactly what you told five minutes ago that mythology is using the symbolic language, cards are using the symbolic language. And when as we're human trying- beings, we love stories. We love, love stories. That's why we love movies. That's why we love books. We, we respond. Yes to the yeah. emotive nature of a story. It teaches us, it guides us, and I, I yeah, I love it. Sorry, and yeah, and our, yeah, in our own lives, there's stories as well. I mean, when you think of it, we are all on heroic journey. We are all like Parsifal looking for Holy Grail, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And, yeah. yeah, and just when you learn how to interpret those symbols in a playful way, without being afraid of tower cards, yes. that's when it comes in handy, because you see that, Oh God, it all makes perfect sense. And okay, now, you know, as we were talking before we started, I got my Saturn return three years ago. Mm. And when I was doing reading Sumi, and I was doing reading Sumi all the time because I was in the abyss of despair. (laughs) I was getting death card, tower card, death card, tower card. And then (laughs) at some point, it just gave me such a hope that there are actually no such things as bad or good. It's all part of life. It's all part of this big tableau, of this big spread, which our lives are. Yeah. And yeah, and this gives like unbelievable hope and unbelievable tool for coping basically with your difficulties. Absolutely. Because this wisdom is so ancient and so universal that when you think, oh God, like why am I stressing out? It's all going to be fine at the end. Yeah, yeah. Same with astrology, you know, there, there's certain astrological yes. schools that are very hung up on all oh, Saturn's nasty and oh, look out for Pluto and everything. But the truth is, every planet, and people have heard me say this many, many times, I'm sure, every planet, every sign, every house in the horoscope is like the Chinese yin yang symbol. There is shadow and light in everything. There is blessing, there is difficulty, there is challenge, there is growth in, in everything. And even the great benefic Jupiter. He's not perfect. He can sort of blow things out of proportion. I mean, right now in the sky, Jupiter and Pluto are together and look at 2020. We're getting an exacerbated energy 
brought about by Jupiter, you know, the great benefic. So mm. hopefully it means higher level things for us in the long run. But um, yeah, yeah th there is shadow and light in everything. So oh. yeah, I agree. Oh, that's, that's, yeah, that's absolutely true. Because so we're back again. And I do apologize. We have been having some internet issues here at my end in Australia. There's so many people in lockdown that I think everybody is on Netflix. <laughs> everybody is, you know, on the internet. I just wanted to say, like, it's it's end of the workday in Australia, so everyone is chilling with Netflix at the That's moment. Exactly so obviously, it keeps crushing, yeah. Yes, so things keep crushing, but we're going to soldier on. <laughs> we're going to get through. We, per we persist, yeah. Right, that's right. So we've talked a lot about how what tarot actually is and i have received a great deal of enlightenment because a lot of that i didn't understand myself either so thank you ksenia and the next piece i want to know though is is how can tarot actually help people especially in 2020 when there's so much upheaval in the world what can tarot do mm -hmm. for people to help them get through these times well actually a great a great deal it helps everybody in any moment of life because it is as i said just a universal tool uh, how I explain it to me, to begin with, how does tarot work? Why the hell is it working? Yes. And yes. I've been looking for the answer for ages because I don't know how it is working. Like, you know, when you're doing readings for yourself all the time, same cards come like, you know, are popping up all the time. And like, you know, you kind of feel this friendly voice almost sometimes. And like, how the hell is it working? <laughs> and uh, what, and then the kind of, the moment of enlightenment came to me when I was once listening to the lecture of Eckhart Tolle and he said a thing which I never thought of that he said we are in the relationship with ourselves mm. we can love ourselves we can hate ourselves we can despise ourselves sometimes we have paranoid feelings and then we hear a voice like oh god like what you're thinking of it's not what's happening yeah. so he said who is the subject of this emotion towards yourself as an object. Mm. And this absolutely blew my mind because that's very true. We mm. are constantly in dialogue with ourselves and how he explained it, that basically this paranoid, like, you know, petty element, it is our ego and the voice of reason, it's our higher self. Yes. And that's what cards are. They are voicing this higher self because like, you know, they, in my opinion, like, you know, they always say, I, I, I've kind of, through my Saturn return, I have undertaken a great deal of all those, like, spiritual, psychological workshops and stuff. Mm -hmm. And people keep telling you, all answers are within yourself. Yeah. And I'm like, there are no answers. Like, if there were, I wouldn't be doing it. Like, I would know <laughs> how to cope. Like, I have zero answers. Yeah. But then when I started, like, thinking of it through cards, Actually, yeah, there are all the answers inside of us. It's just they're totally locked. They're like covered in 200 doors. They're just buried in our subconscious. And cards help us to unlock this. Yes. Because like yes. when we're doing a spread, what we're essentially doing, we have a spread. A spread is our map. Mm -hmm. And it has positions and positions have meanings. And when I fill the positions with cards, I need to associate the card meaning with the meaning of the position and this kind of sparks and ignites my imagination and imagination is a, is a gate to intuition and intuition is the gate for higher self for the source you know and that's how we are tapping into this divine energy which actually knows all our answers already yeah. and this is how we're getting there like you know you yeah. see what I mean? Yeah, I've, I've been amazed I do a daily oracle card reading on my Facebook page and I guess it's the same kind of um, energy, you know, I, I just can't believe how often something, a card will come up with just the message that I need to hear, or if it's not for me, somebody else who's listening gets just the message they need to hear. And it's so profound. And you're right. It is the subconscious yeah. self wanting to be heard. Yeah, wanting because to be like, let out. Mm. I, I know myself when I'm doing readings for myself that I do the spread and I'm like, well, yeah, I actually knew this. Mm. And I'm always standing <laughs> to my clients the cards will never tell you anything that you don't know already. Yeah. It's just probably this is somewhere buried, as I said, or you're denying the truth, or like there are other like psychological taboos and obstacles, but you know that this is true deep down. Yes. And this kind of like provides us with this necessary distance because 
why are we such great psychologists to our friends and never to ourselves? Because you need a distance. You need a bloody distance. And cards give us this distance. When you see it, it's there. It's like on the table, in the cards, this narrative of your life encoded in those universal symbols. And you're like, yeah, that's basically it. You have a distance to look at it and assess it in an objective and like, you know, what would be a good word? Kind of, yeah, in an objective, non-emotional, very, very stable, very calm way. Yeah. And this helps a great deal, I think. Yeah. and Especially in this 20... 20- no, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. sorry. Go ahead. No, especially in this 2020, because I've been thinking a lot about like the reaction of people of how like the toilet paper was disappearing <laughs> oh. and all this stuff. And my and I started thinking, why is it happening? Such thing would never happen in ancient Egypt. Such thing would never happen in Middle Ages, because people were preparing. No, oh, I'm sorry, to death or to bad things, and it was not a tragedy. Yeah. People were living through the ho- through the shadow work, what we call, mm. and people knew that this is not the end and took it calmly. For medieval people, it was about reuniting with the father. Mm. For Egyptians, what absolutely kills me, it's again, it says a lot about our culture, mm. how we call the book of Egyptians, the book of the dead. Yeah. It sounds very scary. In ancient Egyptian, it was called the book of the coming forth into internal light. Oh, that's beautiful. That's the translation. That's that's the translation of the Egyptian title of the book. It was what they were going, they were preparing themselves for the passage. And that's important. We are totally unprepared because what we are told is this positive psychology. You need to stay positive. It's going to be amazing. You don't need to think about bad things. No, we need to think about bad things. Yeah. Because bad things actually bring us forward. Like when you have all butterflies and unicorns, you're not going anywhere. When you have Saturn, when you have Saturn with Pluto and expanded by Jupiter in Capricorn, (laughs) like, you know, that's where we are going somewhere. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. Death is part of life. And, and, you know, that's actually the message of Pluto, isn't it? Like that, that transformation comes through our darkness, through our, our deep, uh you know uh, dark nights of the soul and that's when we transform and that's when we can heal because pluto just to go off on an astrological tangent pluto is um the the, the god of trauma and cataclysms and difficulties but he's also the antidote he's the god of therapy and psychological work and shining a light into our deep dark depths and getting rid of the muck you know so yeah shadow and light as well and i totally agree with what you're saying we are sort of locked up in our ivory castle about life should be like this and we should all win tats lotto and you know it's just not yeah. like that mm. oh, absolutely and i mean in tarot cards the card of scorpio ruled by pluto is the card of death obviously oh, yes. that's the major kind of death this makes perfect sense but like yeah when you look at it why we are lost why we are absolutely unprepared to anything bad because like modern society took away ritual from us yeah for in, for like you know in traditional societies when you from a boy you become a man you go through the rite of passage, you go through initiation, you go through symbolic death. Yeah. When you look at the, all the marriage rituals, like I had the recording of the Russian ritual of marriage, like, you know, it is, it is heartbreaking to watch because the girl is going through symbolic death because wow. she needs to die for her kin and to be reborn in the family of her husband. And it is heartbreaking because like she is crying, like, you know, and there are like laments, like at the funerals, people are lamenting. Mm-hmm. And, but it helps you psychologically to understand that, okay, this period is over and now something new is coming. It, it declutters you psychologically. And that's what Tara is doing for us mm-hmm. because we, we, we've been deprived of those rituals of support of the ritual. But when we do Tara, when we are getting all our 10 of swords with pierced fingers <laughs> and death and the tower, we're like, okay, that's what I'm going through. It's totally mm-hmm. normal. I need to get rid of the old skin before being reborn especially in the moments like now this like beautiful 2020 like roaring 20s but not <laughs> what we expected at all like <laughs> bring back all the jazz and <laughs> ah, yes, yes. I agree. yeah it's only just beginning though you never know we might have a jazz resurgence before very long i agree <laughs> i hope so yeah absolutely but cards help us to call because we look at it and okay this gives us at least some ritual in our lives yeah. to kind of as a stabilizing element 
to know that, okay, maybe now it is death, but it's going to be fine because it's always going to be fine at the end. That's right. It is. And I love looking at things with the bigger perspective too, because this life is just a blip. This life is just one of many lives. And that's my belief anyhow. And so yeah. let's glean all we can from every experience. Let's play with the experiences, as you said in the beginning of life, you know, um, and, and not take things so seriously, perhaps, you know, um, it's true, like, again, yeah, speaking of this, like, hero's journey, while the hero sits in his castle, nothing is happening to him. When he ventures into the dark forest, that's where, like, all the adventures and his destiny yes. is happening. And that? Oh, yeah, I'd much rather be in the dark forest having an adventure than sitting in my little ivory castle. <laughs> For sure. Same, 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 yeah. So, Ksenia, how did, how did you come to discover tarot for yourself? What led you to that path? I don't know. I was about 14, 15. Yeah. And I don't know. I became obsessed with those. Like, I guess because like I maybe it came to be honest from mythology, although I doubt because it's now that I see the connections back in the day. I didn't. I've been very much into mythology since I was like seven with all the Greek Roman world, then Old Norse then Celtic. But then I became obsessed with all those like mysteries. I got the encyclopedia of Masons, you know, and of all those like uh, Kabbalah and Aleister Crowley. I got the whole library. I was saving money from my breakfast at school, you know, to buy the books, how to become a witch and all those things. And I was so much drawn to tarot. Mm. because it just fascinated me like even the imagery of tarot it is mm. so rich and it's so fascinating do you have I a favorite yeah, deck the... the favorite card uh deck that you have do you have a favorite mm, at the moment it is probably the mary l tarot it's the one i did a reading for you with yes it's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful it's a totally not classical deck like she got her own images she got her own meanings for cards but they're so rich mm. that basically about like a spread of 10 cards you can talk for two hours it's <laughs> like you just keep seeing things from it but i need to say they're so different i will show like even for you to see like like my, my Marielle is actually somewhere there on the on the bookshelf but yeah. just to show you like for for as an example i have this for example bianco nero tarot and you see it is very graphical yes. it's all it's all why it's called bianco nero because it is like black and white it is very uh, iconography in terms of iconography it is very traditional it's based on right away tarot but you see they are kind of like you square yeah, they're very beautiful cards, but they're, they're so square. When I'm doing a reading with them, I need only three cards, and they're just telling me, listen, it's going to be like this. Death, <laughs> tower, <laughs> this, this, and this. Like, no, no, like, sugar coating, no nothing. Just, look, that's what's happening. Boom, 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 boom. Very <laughs> straightforward. It's like talking, like, you know, to a kind of, I don't know, middle-aged man who doesn't think about anything. He's like, look, I'm not going to lie to you. That's what it is. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> not thinking how to make it beautiful and like easy for you to accept. No, just boom. That's yeah. what they are, like black and white. And then I have this very beautiful Shadowscape Staro, which is a very famous deck. And they are like, you know, they are lush because they are all in this, in those oh. like images, you know, like beautiful yeah. girls and fishes and like that's the strength card or like glowing lion, very much like I would say like Arnavo figures, very subtle, very like beautiful. And obviously, yeah, he's like three of pentacles, the card of creativity with those like angelic oh, yeah. figures and stars oh. and flowers. Yeah like the four of swords with like lotus flowers so obviously <laughs> such cards would give you very different kind of message those yeah. give you the message like elves would talk to you when it would be poetry when it would be like all encoded in the beautiful like poetic symbols and sometimes when i know that like the, the shit storm is happening and I don't want to hear that the bad news I'm using this deck because I know that they would say the same probably things but in a very kind of tactful and subtle and caring way yeah. so they you have really such have to use your intuition voice. sorry yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and the, but they have very different voices and I can't even say I have so many decks and I'm kind of a collector of decks and 
Yeah. So do you, I do think you get for a each sense thing, of a person before you do a reading for them and then choose the deck that you feel is right for that person? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I know from the question, like, I mean, if it is, if I usually for people whom I don't know very well, who are not my friends, I would start by doing a reading with kind of Bianco Nero because they would be like very straightforward and they would just give you kind of the skeleton, the roadmap of what's going on. But then to elaborate, I would keep doing readings with more like in depth decks like Marielle Tarot or like Shadowscapes or like, you know, I have a few decks of like Celtic Tarot, the Wildwood Tarot, the Druid Oracle Tarot, which are all like kind of full of Celtic imagery, which obviously is very dear to my heart. Yes, just on and that, I'd love to hear more of what drew you. Like you grew up in Russia and you yeah. were drawn to go to Ireland to study and to do a PhD. Um, how did that sort of manifest for you? What, what drew you there? Oh, that's like a, not a big question. As I said, I was reading mythologists since I was five. Yeah. And I kind of went absolutely, by the time I was 14, 15, I went absolutely through lots of them. And then I was in the bookshop and I saw a book which is called Celtic Mythology. And I was like, I don't know what is this. I don't know who are Celts. I've never heard of them. No clue. And I bought them and I was just blown away because... I don't know. I don't know if it is easy to read. Like maybe it's, I mean, if you like mythology, I guess it's easy to read. If you don't understand it, it's just like absolutely incomprehensible. But I started reading those tales, those like medieval Irish tales, and I was blown away because I've never seen anything so beautiful and so yeah. wise as those tales. Mm -hmm. The beauty of our early like Irish poetry and early Irish tales and so we're speaking of tales written in Middle Irish, kind of starting from the 8th to the 12th century. This is something which absolutely blows your mind. Mm. And like the one that absolutely was beautiful, the one which kind of absolutely I adored, it's a tale called Ashinga Angusa, the vision of Angus. It's how the god Angus, he was sleeping at night and then he woke up because he saw a vision of a girl and she was playing timpan. It's sort of like a lyre apparently, or some fiddle. We don't know what kind of instrument it is. And he was obsessed by this image. And um, then he woke up and he became like sick for a year because he was love sick. And then he started looking for this girl all over Ireland. And then he found like a flock of so swans at the end. And she was a shapeshifter because she was becoming a swan, uh, like at certain points of her life. And so he became a swan as well. And then they were flying together. I mean, like when you think of it, what that's, that's to be honest, why I love ancient uh, myths. Because now when we are, we absolutely discarded them and we started our way in neuroscience, in psychology, in psychoanalysis. But surprisingly, we kind of ended up with the same results <laughs> as they cycle. already knew. Mm. Because like when you think of it, and uh, this tale was very well researched because it's so very famous. Actually, there was a research that uh, obviously all uh, early... Irish tales, they're written down by, by monks, by clerics. And so probably it is um, this girl, the swan girl, she basically represents the soul and it is based on those like, you know, kind of early Christian teachings of kind of a, a man searching for his soul and kind of longing for, the reu for reuniting with like, you know, something transcendental. So they're so deep. They're absolutely unbelievably deep. At the same time, this kind of Christian element is absolutely in no way discards the way that there was a kind of mm, uh, pre-Christian substratum in those tales, the kind of those ancient narratives, they were actually very well preserved. They were probably embellished with the Christian kind of way of thinking, but they preserved the, the ancient imagery. And when we start just looking at all the layers of meaning of those tales they're so enriching it's just yeah. basically it tells us everything that we need to know about life yes. and about yeah. like what's going on with us in this world yeah. well as i said in the intro i was just so impressed by the way you combined what was psychologically being spoken in the tarot and it just really hit me to the core with exactly what i was going through in my life you combined that with um, uh, uh, mythological interpretations of the cards that you were using and how that applied to my life. And that just added a layer of richness and depth 
to the mm. whole reading that I've never encountered before in I have had tarot oh, readings yeah. done even though I have not um mm. you know don't know a great deal about it um and and I've never encountered anything like that before it, it just adds so much dimension to yeah I mean like it's not that I'm doing it on purpose it's just oh, that I know such yeah. things yeah and they just come to my mind very naturally but I think that we can find a good deal of answers to our questions in those ancient systems because yeah because somehow they knew it all yeah. I don't know yeah. to be honest like the more I research ancient cultures yeah I know I I after like 10 years in academia researching medieval West. I now shifted totally to Korea, to Japan, to Japanese uh, myths. And it amazes me. They knew absolutely everything we are only discovering now. Mm. How did they know it? I don't know. They were closer to nature. As I said, they had like this support of ritual. Their life in many ways were deeper and much more meaningful than ours. Yes, I agree. In fact, um, the, the whole um, story in shamanic astrology, well, it's not even in shamanic astrology, it's in ancient Vedic astrology as well, uh, mm -hmm. of our journey as souls on a 26,000 year cycle. Um, it's kind of complex, but it, it actually corresponds to Stonehenge and the, the way that stones are lined up at, at Stonehenge to at certain, it's a calendar of 26,000 years, the cycle of the... Yeah, the um, oh, the name escapes me. The the actual name for the, the the cycle, but it's a now I'm getting all complex. But the sun is in a binary system with the star Sirius that circles in a binary system every twenty six thousand years. And as we oh, reach, yeah, as we reach um, the golden age, that's when you know we can talk to one another sort of telepathically. That's when. Um, we, we are really in tune with everything and our knowledge as human beings is at its height and our abilities as human beings are, is at its height. And then um, the, we start to go down into the dark age, which occurred, some people believe, sort of in, the, in the, the Middle Ages. The dark ages were known as the dark ages for that reason. And then the soul begins to go back up on a 12,000 year cycle. So 12,000 years to come down in conscious awareness as, as a society, as human beings and 12,000 years to rise up back into the golden age. And we're only just coming out of that dark age now. We've probably got another 10,000 years ahead of us rising back up in our conscious awareness. So when you speak of how the ancients, say the Persians 3,000 years BC had all this astrological knowledge and, and you know, looked at how to, you know, worked with the stars and nature and had all these systems and psychological um, approaches to things that we're only just like, oh, finding out again now and rediscovering now it's because they were coming down out of that heightened awareness down into the darkness where we've lost a lot of this stuff. We've lost our ability to understand what the ancient Egyptians were doing with their amazing pyramid. That was perhaps an electricity conductor back in the day, you know? And oh, yes. we, yeah. And we just see it as a, yes. you know, a tomb for, you know, uh, but it, it maybe it was so much more than that. And, Anyhow, so we're, we're rising up now and, and that's why the rediscover of the rediscovery of these systems of these mythologies. It's so exciting as we learn, not only as we rediscover them, but as we learn their truth and the, and the reality of them. It's not hidden any longer. We're, we're awakening and 2020 is a big year of awakening for this to happen, for it's raising so, yeah. consciousness, for, for being able to understand these things that we have sort of had the blinkers on our eyes for for you know hundreds of years now we're starting to wake up now we're starting to realize and it's through you know what you have done your research of these ancient mythologies and realizing what they actually are saying their meaning that i find it so empowering and, I, and i've gone off on a tangent but i do get so excited it about is. it which is you know what, it what is, you're it doing is because as yeah. as well, it's everything you know all those mythologies of the planets mm. are now being realized for what they were actually saying like you were talking about the beautiful story of the swan and the, the, the woman and the swan and the man and the swan. I mean, you, you, the realization of what their actually, their message is rather than a pretty fairy story. It's now got meaning. It's now got substance. And this is the exciting thing. So yeah. I've gone off on a tangent. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like uh, for ancient world, there is no such thing as art for the sake of art, as Oscar mm. Wilde said, mm. absolutely everything had meaning. And when you think of it, like, 
everything always had a spiritual meaning. Yeah. Even like, you know, simple procedures, like for example, in Ireland, it was that on the 1st of May, the festival of Beltane, there were bonfires and the uh, cattle was meant to walk through the bonfires. And actually, apparently it has a very practical reason because I don't know, I, I'm not a farmer, but I think the fire, it kind of like kills the insects and the skin of animals or something, something. So it has an absolutely practical explanation, but it also has a symbolic explanation, this purification through fire, mm. this purifying ritual. And that's how they were thinking. Each kind of, I'm not saying that each single moment of the day was full of spiritual meanings. They were people after all, they needed somehow to cope with the difficulties of life. But there was this, this dimension ever present that there is something bigger and now we don't have it no. and i think this is the biggest problem to be honest i'm such an old soul my son is in capricorn like you know my moon is in pisces yeah. i feel like i should have been born thousand years ago that was my time <laughs> yes. i feel absolutely yes. not belonging to this world and people care about like when when progress for people means that the new model of a phone is appearing on the market guys oh. It's a joke, like seriously. I mean, that's not a progress. I just see daily that we are regressing somewhere because like people are thinking about things that don't even need to be thought of. Yeah. That's not the focus of our life. We're here for a different reason. Yeah. We're here to understand who we are and why we're here and what the hell is going on. Yeah. And the fact that we live in this, like, yeah, as Nietzsche said that God is dead, that we killed God. And this, the Christian God was not replaced by anything. And it, it, it gives me hope now, yeah, as many people are saying, the 2020 gave us this necessary pause for actually thinking and yeah. for, and lots of people are awakening because they were forced to stop and to yeah. start thinking about something else yeah. than just being in this like wheel of earning money, like running somewhere, achieving some momentarily successes and stuff. Yeah. I hope that it's making many people to rethink the values and I, I yeah, hope what's so going too. on. Yeah. And I'm seeing that it is happening. Um, yeah. And I think the next six months or five months is going to see it accelerate even faster, actually. But I, I mm. love, like I did a bit of research about Celtic astrology before um, we got together this evening. And, um, you know, one of the, the main themes in Celtic astrology was that there is no separate, that's my spiritual life and that's my everyday life. And, and this is my other, you know, everything was just all intertwined. Mm -hmm. Nature was part of mundane life and, mm -hmm. and um, spirituality was part of nature and part of everyday, ordinary living, breathing. And that's, that's what I want to bring back. You know, that this is exactly yeah. not, yeah. you go to church this kind on of, Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, church is on a Sunday and then the rest of the week you do this and then, you know, and, we have such compartmentalized lives and I, I much prefer flow and I, that's what I want to bring back into being in my yeah. life. Yeah. 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 The sort of like syncretic way of thinking mm -hmm. when the thing does not mean only this, but it means this and this and this and this. Yes. That's why yes. tarot is handy because as I said, uh, tarot is a tool for creative thinking. Yeah. We see it, those symbols, we need to associate them with a certain position. And this sparks our imagination and we need to spark it because that's when we start kind of understanding that it's not that this is this, but that one thing can mean very many things, you know? Yes. And that, yeah, that everything is interconnected. Yeah, that's right. So are you um, being into the, 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 those ancient practices and tarot, do you look for omens in your life? Do you, do you see certain signs as being, you know, oh, there's meaning in that or there's synchronicity in something happening? Is that? Oh, yeah, different? absolutely. And I think we all should do it going back to what we started with. If we take life as a game, I actually, I, I made, I, I was back home in Russia about like a year ago. Yeah, it was last August. And because like, for, for me now, Russia is basically the, the place where I was born, where my mom lives. I don't really have life there. Yeah. Because like my work is in Ireland, my friends are in Ireland and stuff. And so I, I kind of like, my mind was absolutely free. And I started this game with myself. I was like, okay, I, on every day, I will be registering signs sent by me by universe. And I was playing this game with myself. I usually, every day I kind of notice synchronous numbers like 11, 11 on my phone and 1717 and all those things but 
not really much behind this because like I'm working and I'm doing things and I'm talking to friends but that kind of my mind was free and I was just walking in town and like visiting places and the amount of deal I've collected was just overwhelming basically when you start paying attention to it everything is assigned by from universe I would be sitting having coffee alone in the coffee shop and the women at the kind of neighbor at the table next to me they would be talking and i would overhear the part of their conversation which would absolutely resonate apply to the question that i had you know and yeah and sometimes you're going like the street musician is playing the tune and you're listening to lyrics and you're like okay that's the answer like you know or that resonates so strongly when it's again when we get this playful element it is so supporting it's because joy. we know we are not alone. The universe is supporting us. It's given us signs. Yeah. It's given us like those, like little kind of, I don't know, yeah. little yeah. kind of sparks of help daily. It's yeah. just that we are, we are blind, we are running and we don't notice it. That's right. I am, um, I really, since my, um, since my divorce, which was about 10 years ago, I, I've really started to come into a, a a sensory or not a sensory perception but a, um, a, an, an acknowledgement of, of animals because I, I live in sort of provincial Australia and there's just you know, native animals everywhere all the time and they all have symbology I mean anyone can google the the totem of a parrot you know a parrot totem will tell you and it's a, and if you have a significant encounter with a parrot you know you're out in the backyard perhaps pulling some weeds and a parrot comes and lands about two feet away from you um, and sort of looks at you funny and sort of like trying to communicate something with you while I run inside and I Google parrot totem and it's got this yeah, message yeah. like, oh, just what I needed to hear. And it adds so much sparkle, it adds so much depth and you really start to feel like the universe is speaking to you. Um, like the, like there's interaction, like we were speaking of a moment ago, between our everyday life and the natural world and the spiritual world all coming together as one. We've just got to slow down and have open eyes and ears and sensory perception to to experience it and see it. I love oh, it. Is, yeah, it is very true, you know, because like, yeah, as I said, I shifted totally to the East recently in my studies. So I'm now reading all the Tibetan Book of the Dead, everything about Buddhism. And like in in well, in Hinduism probably more than in Buddhism, because in Buddhism kind of this world, the material world, it's all like illusion and you don't yeah. need to pay attention yeah. to it. But there is this idea in like uh, Indian religions in general that we are all connected. It is this idea of Brahman, of this creator of the world, and our soul as Atman, and that Atman is Brahman, that we are all like connected to the source that we are all like, you know, we are basically the universe. We are all connected. And there is even like this kind of practice in Hinduism that you kind of, why is this, this Ahimsa principle of not harming? Because like this bird, it is you in a way, and this plant, it is you, and it's all part of this world soul. Those are all manifestations of Brahman. Yeah. And so you're not supposed to harm anything because it's all you. Mm. And even when I thought of it, it's it's when I was in the middle of this in the middle of this reading about all those things that we are absolutely everything. We are this plant in the garden. We are this bird singing on the tree. I watched this documentary of David Attenborough about how life on Earth <laughs> appeared, and this actually gave me such a kind of like revelation because I was like, we all came from this one single. I don't know, whatever it was. Black it all hole. started basically with two cells. Yeah, with two cells flying, swimming somewhere in the ocean and they connected. And then there was those like primitive organisms from which absolutely everything emerged. Mm. So evolutionary, we are really connected. I mean, like it's billions of years ago, but still we all emerged, all the plants, all the birds, all the animals. We all emerged from one ancestor which was like a few cells somehow like becoming this very primitive organism. And then there was the first organism which developed a spine. Yeah. And this became us. This became yeah. dogs, cats, yeah. absolutely all mammals, you know, everything which has a spine. So when you think of it, you're really absolutely connected to everything. And I think this is also like such a good, good kind of way of stabilizing yourself in the yeah. moments of upheaval that yes. you are never alone. Yes. It's your, it's our habitat. We are connected to everything. We are part of something bigger. 
That's what I keep telling. That's what cards keep telling us. Yeah. We're never alone. We are part of this ancient wisdom, of this language of symbols, of this natural world and all of the rituals. It gives you a bigger picture and it supports you, I think. That is glorious. That's just glorious. So if someone comes for a reading... <laughs> Cindy, you're so good. You're so oh, enthusiastic. I love it. I love it, though, now because I totally resonate with everything that you're saying. So if someone comes for a reading with you, they're, they're essentially getting not just all oh, pull some cards, but they're getting omens. They're getting mythology. They're getting the, the depth of wisdom of the ages, really, that, that is tarot um, as a sign, as a, as a, as a game, as a... Uh, a, you know, a, a source for spirit to speak through yeah. to someone. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's just perfect. Yeah, oh, yeah it's like I the love the tarot spirit, all yeah. of a sudden. <laughs> no, it's, it's, yeah, it's, they, I, I mean, like, I've been doing it for 15 years and I'm still fascinated. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And still, I kind of, I explain to myself logically, as I said, how it is working through this, like, creative thinking and stuff. But still, every time I'm getting, like, sometimes you're like okay i kind of asked this question yesterday but i'm gonna ask today with the different deck and you're getting same cards i don't know still how it is working and like, how is this possible but yeah okay i'm getting the answer sorry for disturbing you well okay okay I see. <laughs> so tell us ksenia if someone um orders uh, a reading with you from my my website guiding star astrology um if they I'll leave the link in the description below. And if somebody comes and orders a reading from you, what's going to happen? What are that? What are the people going to get? Which really depends on the question. I mean, like I, I offer a good variety of readings. You know, we can look at the general situation with the basic spread, like Celtic tarot, or sorry, Celtic, Celtic cross spread. We can look at specific questions, very mundane questions. Like, obviously, a very popular question is, does Bob love me? <laughs> yes, when am I going to find love again? Yes, the age old yeah, baby. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, but another, yeah, yeah, or, like, something about work. Or, like, for example, because for myself, I kind of discovered not that long time ago that there are lots of very interesting in-depth uh, spreads, like they, there are spreads like, you know, for discovering your source of creativity, for like your past life spread. Actually, I've done one for myself recently. It was very interesting because like you look at where your soul is now, where it used to be, what is your path, your dharma. You look at like, you know, what is your final destination of your soul. So that's very interesting because it gives wow. us such a big picture. There is another fascinating spread. It's called the, mm, it's actually based on the myth of uh, the Sumerian Babylonian goddess Ishtar Inanna, how she, of her descent to hell. Right. And uh, it is, it is a very powerful spread for shadow work, for example. It is like, what would be your story? What would be the way how you need to face your shadow, your alter ego, your dark self? Mm -hmm. And then what would be the means, the tools for ascending, like, you know, and discovering the new you. So, yeah. Depending on the question, I will pick up a deck. If necessary, I would do like, you know, a few spreads with clarification. And yeah, and then I just normally record a video in which I chit chat and describe what the cards told me. And um, so I usually try to pick video, up also. People get a video recording of your tarot reading. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they were, they were to be honest, it's worth. Mm, Book a reading yeah. and, and then there's a, some email communication. They would ask some questions and you would sort of get an idea yeah. for what they're wanting yeah. to know, decide which yeah. spread to yeah. use. Mm. Because like, you know, I mean, like tarot is same as astrology. I think many people who are very far away those practices, they think that tarot readers and astrologers, we are like <laughs> sitting in our mantles looking at the crystal ball. Yeah. No, yeah. we're not looking at the crystal ball. We're not reading way. the... Yeah, we're not reading the future. It's actually science mm -hmm. in itself. Mm -hmm. We're interpreting facts that we are given. And, um, uh, and so in this way, like, I mean, uh, Tara is as much psychology mm -hmm. as it is the divination tool because I need to know generally because it, it even helps me, you know, it helps me to interpret it correctly because like a friend, uh, I, I was doing it, uh, a reading for a girl about like her life and love and um, uh, how I knew her is that she was a teacher of meditation in my shala in the yoga school I'm going to. And I knew her as this absolutely divine being, very calm, very quiet with beautiful meditations. And then I started doing the reading for her 
and all her reading was basically pentacles, 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 pentacles. And I was like, okay, she must be, I don't know, somehow from her attitude, I was like, okay, she must be a Virgo because she's getting this earth energy. And then I, I wrote to her, I'm like, I'm sorry, you give the impression to me that you are this kind of elf <laughs> from the sky, you know? But I'm like, you get all the cards from pentacles and like, what's the story? I was like, and yeah, it turned out she's Virgo rising. Wow. And actually when she's not a meditation teacher, she's such a driven businesswoman. She works in some IT company and she basically has all work, no fun. And for all people, she, because the card that she got for how other people see her with the uh, king of pentacles, which was very masculine energy and which was very earthy energy. And yeah, it turned out that basically that's how her colleagues would see her because she has a very high position in some like very rich, like, like massive corporation. Yeah. And I was like, okay, like, <laughs> okay, that was, that's how I kind of felt. Yeah. But knowing those details in advance would actually help me yes. because my interpretation became like a lot longer yeah. which i was like okay maybe you're a Virgo rising maybe you're a capricorn maybe you're all work no fun but i'm not sure and then it turned out that it was the case but knowing as many details about a person in advance helps me also to kind of use Same. logic and psychology yeah, yeah, yeah to kind of see what it can be about because as i said those are symbols they can have lots of meanings mm. like i mean yeah the first thing about pentacles it can be that you are yeah that you're a capricorn or virgo or taurus but it can mean lots of other things it can mean that i don't know you're clinging to money or like you know that basically like material success material manifestation is coming for you so knowing what actually is happening in your life would help me a great deal to shorten my explanation yeah. and to be more precise because like we still need to know what's going on with the person that's right. So, yeah, yeah. backgrounds so, always very helpful in absolutely. astrology as yeah. well, so that you can address the needs of the person. I mean, a lot of people, like you say, expect you to know, like you know, get some divine um, sort of download about yeah, whatever's going on in their life. But um, you are using a science, exactly what you say, and mm -hmm. and a bit of bit of information helps to be able to pinpoint mm -hmm. the needs of the person and to support them better in their journey, which is really what we're here to do: to support people in their journey, mm -hmm. to give, to use our knowledge of this science to help give insight and light to the path. And so the, you know, the more background, the better <laughs> I feel. Yeah, yeah. That sort of thing. yeah. And that's why I'm kind of always, I, I prefer doing pre-recorded videos for all of like my clients, because first of all, I need to be in a special kind of state for doing Same. it. Sometimes the energy are bad. Sometimes I'm feeling low and sometimes people are like, Oh, can you do tonight because like such a pressing issue and i'm feeling bad basically i had a bad day and i do this reading and it's not inspiring because that's, that's just it. not because like I, i'm still a channeler i need to be absolutely open-minded and light-hearted to do it and then after i do the reading i prefer actually to kind of sit on it for about a day yeah. Because sometimes, like, I see it, it, I usually see straight away what's going on, but I prefer to give myself some time to think of the cards, yeah. and I prefer to be alone, not to be kind of distraught, because I'm kind of in this trance with cards, and I'm like, okay, what's going on? Yeah, and uh, so I prefer to do it on my own, sorry for that, like, many people would like to have a leave session, but yeah. if you have questions, come back to me, I will be helpful to clarify, we can do a small like you know additional reading with clarifying clarifying cards but yeah basically i'm sorry but i would prefer to do yeah. it on my own it's usually more successful so everyone benefit from it at the end that's right i'm the same with astrology i feel the same in fact um i find being a pisces rising person that if i um uh, am interacting with with people's energy too much sometimes i'll do maybe four readings in a day which i know is a lot yeah. maybe i shouldn't be doing that much but um, that I am absolutely burnt out because I absorb everybody's energy and all their suffering and all their hurt and all their wounding yeah. through, I do it through immersing myself into the chart as well, because that's yeah. their energy also, but it's even more yeah. exacerbated when you're in the presence of someone. And as a healer, you do have to sort of guard your own well being so that you have something to give. Um, that's, that's very, very important. Yeah. Because, yeah, because like many friends are asking me, wouldn't it better if we sit together because then you would be, in my energy straight away because I'm next to you. 
but no, I'm sorry, it wouldn't be better because I'm too much in your energy <laughs> and I'm just scanning all of it. And I see the cards and I'm overwhelming. My heart is racing, you know, I can't think clearly. I need this total cal calmness, mm -hmm. this moment of peace when kind of, I, I still don't know like how it's working for me, but I, I know, I notice, I register how my inner state is changing. And I know even before I start, if I'm in the state, I'm like, okay, it's going to be a very good reading that I just come to some sort of like inner sanctum, you know, in some sort of sanctuary inside myself. I don't know how it's happening. It needs to be a right moment. Mm -hmm. And then from this position of calmness and totally emptied mind, I can start kind of downloading and what mm -hmm. and looking what the cards are about. Because when a person is next to me, exactly, I, I'm being nervous. I don't want to, like, I'm thinking, oh, I'm taking too much time with the cards. Like, I yeah. need to come up with a question. You're not, <laughs> on, you're not as much in the zone, are you? When, yeah. <laughs> when there's that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I get it. I get it. So I think that's beautiful that you offer your reading by um, recording and um, like video recording. And so I, I've actually played mine a couple of times and really gone back and enjoyed it. Um, and uh, with a recording, you get so much more out of it because the second time go, you, it goes a bit deeper with you or, um, you know, yeah. you pick up on nuances that you missed so, yeah. the first time you, you watched. So, so having that is really helpful. I'm sorry yeah. if there's a noise yeah. in the background. My, my children are in the room next door. I don't hear so, it. So. <laughs> fine. I don't um, hear yeah. it. Cool. Well, that's great. Look, um, is there anything else that you wanted to add that we haven't kind of covered, Ksenia? Anything else that you want to share with the viewers um, of this, this video, perhaps? Not really? Mm, no, I think pretty much everything I wanted to say, I've said, yeah. I mean, like, if we would like to talk about, like, a little bit more about oracle cards oh you know oracle cards are much more straightforward and i use them in my readings too because i usually finish every reading i'm doing with like picking up an oracle card i have like also multiple decks i have like the bird oracle the animal oracle the shamanic medicine oracle and this would give us the kind of final thought of like you know it's kind of bottom line of what it can be about so oracle cards are also a, a great tool but for me, I would never be working also only with, with Oracle cards. I know some people work only with Oracle cards. They do readings with Oracle cards. But for me, actually, they are too straightforward. Uh -huh. They don't give me room for much thinking because it's written like something, I don't know, something like, this is it. Yeah. That's your card, like, you know? Yeah. And yeah, there is like, I don't know, you're getting carved, I don't know, like the cave. So you go into the dark cave, you're being transformed. Hooray, hooray, congratulations. And for me, it's kind of a bit one to two, two like one dimensional. It's great to have as a kind of final thought after the entire reading. But, or for example, sometimes I start like my morning with pulling one card just to see the energy. And that's great. Yeah. But when you want to kind of go deeper, Yes. Into things. I think that's where you will need to everything. Which is what people come to a yeah, tarot so, reading for anyhow. You know, they want yeah. the depth. They want more than just you know, a little simple, mm. oh, happily ever after kind mm. of whatever. Mm. Yeah. 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 So I suppose that's it. That's all yeah. I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That's lovely. Well, Ksenia is yeah. offering her services on my website. I'm so delighted. As you can see, she is so intelligent and so intuitive about um, what she's doing. Um, and she combines intelligence and intuition together, which is just the best combination to have, obviously. Um, so I'm so grateful that she's joined me at Guiding Star. And if you would like a reading with her, hop over to the description below and, um, and book in with Ksenia. I'm sure she'll be flat out before very long <laughs> because it's so lovely to have you here. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. It has been a joy and a delight. And I hope you'll join me next week for another coffee session where we meet another of the beautiful healers and astrologers and workers in the spiritual realm who are going to join me uh, in the year ahead on Guiding Star. Thanks very much and I'll catch you then. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Ksenia. It was amazing.